somebody asked me a question at some point in my comment section I don't I recall when and I don't recall your name sorry but I do recall responding to it the question pertaining to something along the lines of and I'm obviously paraphrasing if I had any idea of whether or not they'd actually start to implement the uh, stuff that they're learning in this program the building racial literacy program uh, if they had actually started to implement that into you know their everyday classroom life um, now obviously with me not actually being physically in the classrooms and not sp as of yet spoken to anybody that's had a child in the vicinity of said classrooms I can't answer that vehemently uh, or one way or the other uh, I suppose even with the, all the people that are involved they're very secretive as to who's involved they're very evasive that freedom of information request uh, from the first video that I made on these people it's, that everything is very hush hush kept behind closed doors type of thing they even make you jump through a plethora of hoops before you can even actually uh, officially join this program and then and only then you get access to the resources etc but one thing we do know that they have started to do is to build some of them anyway uh, uh, anti-racist clubs you know so I think that's part of the action plan thing that you have to do for the months that you're there and uh, taking part in the training sessions it sounds so great bold and progressive all the usual jargon but uh, it's kind of funny that you ask that and then something happened last night where I effectively broke the fourth wall. I did exactly what I said I wasn't going to do. I just, I lost the head to a, kind of lost the head, shall we say, uh, with one of the two women in question who are, were being paraded out for every video appearance, you know, teasing the up and coming uh, round two of the Building Racial Literacy Programme with the first woman being on screen just now. And there's a there, Miss uh, Walters and as you can see here, she says, excited for our Smithy Equality Anti-Racist Club to share our experiences, right? So this, I initially, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of Glasgow, right? So I thought that was a school. I, I, I And then I went onto the website and there's like seven or eight primary schools that all come under the Smithy Croft banner, uh, banner drop or bannership, so to speak. Ownership, to which, fuck's sake, I, ownership, um, so I don't know if it's a collection of schools or what, but I think there's one high school. But the point being though, that this woman has incorporated this uh, building racial literacy program. She's taken what she's uh, uh, learning via her training and she's now taking it and putting it into practice. And one of the ways that she's going about that is she has actually created the club. And Melina herself, she was talking about the fact that they were planning their first webinar for all of the clubs. Who knows how many of these clubs there actually are? I mean, there can't be any more in theory than there were presently people uh, classified as educators that were part of the uh, phase one or the first round of the building racial literacy program. So not that many, but how many club, how many kids per club? Well, there's another question to ask yourself. But anyway, so this, this goes on a bit, obviously. I mean, <laughs> representation matters, anti-racist, enthusiastic, and she's an LGBT champion, and she's an English teacher. I mean, you're entitled to put what you want on your Twitter, I, I assume, but I thought the whole point of when you were a teacher, you were supposed to be a bit more private with things. That's how it works up here, or it used to be the case anyway. But ah, oh, no, the teachers down in Glasgow just seem to brag about the fact that they're pro-LGBT, or they go even a step further. In her instance, she uh, insists she's an LGB plus champion, whatever the fuck that means. And of course, representation matters, and what does she mean by that? Well, she's advocating for beams, probably. Well, there's no probably about it. But anyway, it's not really her that I'm focusing on. It's the other woman, which I'll come on to in just a second, as it was her that I said what I said to you last night. Not that I said anything untoward, but it's just got me thinking a little bit since then. But uh, before I actually go on to Twitter instead of referring to Telegram, that Stephen Lawrence Day is the backdrop for the Smithy Croft Equality Group. This is the Anti-Racist Club's Twitter, right? Glasgow East End High School, here to celebrate equality and diversity. Hashtag equality, hashtag anti-racist, hashtag diversity. Location is just below the cutoff point on my recorded screen, but it says Glasgow, Scotland. Right? And it's Steve Lawrence Day's the backdrop. Do you not think that's a bit disrespectful to the first racially motivated, motivated murder victim in Scotland? He never gets a mention. He never gets addressed. And nobody's calling for his death to be exploited, but he could be addressed. They're quite happy to talk about Steve Lawrence to no end, to the point where it's almost milking, beating a dead horse type thing. 
it's it's a, it's a relentless drive here. I mean, it was only last year, or it might have been two years ago now, where Graham Campbell got a motion passed by Glasgow Council to recognise Stephen Lawrence Day, celebrate Stephen Lawrence Day. Where's Chris Donald's Day? In Glasgow, the same fucking city that the boy was from. Why do we do more in Scotland, or Glasgow anyway, the area of Glasgow, do more in Scotland to give up the impression that Stephen Lawrence is somebody that we should remember and care about, but a white boy's death in the most brutal of fashions is never discussed, but that's the sort of thing you would come to expect from the likes of an equality group that's predicated on the notion of so-called anti-racism. Anyhow, I'm just effectively giving this guy an extended answer to his question, but I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, this should be the last thing on the club aspect of this video, which was kind of more about your question than anything else, the best I can give you, the best answer I can give you just now anyway. But uh, this is the potential of an anti-racist club. This was also shared by Melina, the big brain as well. And it says here that empowered pupils who can envision and enact anti-racist solutions, uh, increased confidence in talking about racism, a safer space for pupils who experience racism, responsible global citizens, empathy is something you can't teach, but we'll just pretend that you can. It's pandering, essentially, if that's what you're, if you're going to insist that empathy is being taught, it's pandering. Uh, shared sense of humanity. The club helps you deal... Oh, fuck you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the club helps you deal uh, with and process experiences that you've been through and you can help to prevent others going through the same. That's a bit of a cop Any group could do that. Uh, teacher... Oh, what the fuck? Jesus Christ. <sighs> this is his laptop. I mean, I'm using a spare laptop that was only ever meant to be used if the initial spare broke, so that's why I'm having so many fucking issues. But anyway... Teachers learning alongside pupils and embedding anti-racism in their practice. And what that means, obviously, is while the teacher is learning via the learning, uh, the, um, what's it, building racial literacy program, she's taking what she's learning from that and she's adopting it at the classroom. So they're both learning together. Isn't that nice and progressive? It also says right at the bottom, fostering pride in your identity uh, and higher racial literacy. You can't fix a problem if you can't see it. So yes, there is anti-racist clubs, and in fact, when I was looking about yesterday, uh, or last night even, there's even at present a uh, competition between the clubs who can promote the most anti-racist message, you know. Only two videos so far, but they're so fucking bad, I'm not playing them. I don't know how old these kids are, but they can't be that old if they're making stuff like that, so I'm not going to show that. As much as it kind of shows you what they've obviously been taught to, th to think and say, it still would kind of look as if I'm ridiculing children. And there's something more fundamental that I want to address just now. What would you say to a colleague about the Building Racial Literacy Programme? On every level, this programme is rich. <laughs> okay. In compassion. It's amazing how much you learn in three months. It is as if you have completed a full year at university. The help has been incredible. You gain invaluable networks of people and organisations across Scotland. If I was talking to a colleague about <laughs> building racial literacy, I would say it should be obligatory for all those working in education to experience a course like this. Wow. In order to take a truly anti-racist stance in our schools and institutions, we need people to be informed and reflective in a way that is structured, safe and facilitated. And that is exactly what this programme offers. Has the impact of the Building Racial Literacy programme been on you? I learnt so much and I have the courage now to be brave. I am aware that with such complexities, my learning journey will be ongoing and I will make mistakes but I will have the humility to apologise and now have the confidence to do that. The impact of building racial literacy on me personally was that it's helped me to be more honest and open about my experiences and the experiences of others that I've witnessed. It has helped me to better articulate myself on racial issues and respond from an informed perspective. The programme has really encouraged reflection and progression. I've learned so much about myself what has the impact of the Building Racial Literacy programme been on your learners? The impact of Building Racial Literacy on my learners was a more confident, comfortable educator to respond to their needs. It's helped me to better communicate my own experiences and respond to others' experiences, as well as making me more confident in tackling issues that occur with staff and other practitioners. 
The ability to discuss race and race issues confidently and from an informed perspective is so empowering. The programme has already had a positive effect on the young people at the school. I have set up an anti-racism club. I have also put together a plan for PSE lessons um, that will last a few weeks. Because of the programme and listening to the young people at the club, this, these lessons have inner depth that I wouldn't have had before. Now I let those videos play because as I was saying that's the two women that were kind of trotted out each and every time there was a sort of teaser trailer if you will uh, for the upcoming building racial literacy and now obviously I've actually got it in another tab the application for it and then it's kind of hit or miss whether or not they'll get back to you to tell you whether you've been accepted or not well I have no intention of actually filling it out because even if they did accept me if I pretended to be some random woman or man whatever um, and they accepted me it's the the hoops that you then have to jump through fuck that but anyway i just want to show one last thing before i get back to the woman in question so obviously this is melina herself here but you might have heard of the the article that was doing the round in the last few weeks it's a bit of a daft article in the sense that they, they're not new resources but i'm still thankful that the attention has been brought to them what i'm referring to obviously is the stuff about the kilt but if you actually read through the article, you will come to find there's a section in there where they're talking about white tears. Now, <laughs> what it doesn't tell you in the article, from from memory, is where that actually came from. Who said that? They kind of just present it as if this is a Scottish government resource. They're not Scottish government resources. The Scottish government are working with these people. And they create the resources. The government just rubber stamp them. That's why Thin Lips, when she was questioned on Sky News about the matter, where the, the white privilege test for teachers, she didn't, well, she, well, she pretended, she didn't have a fucking clue which, uh, what that was about, about. <laughs> whether or not there's any truth to it, who knows, point is, it's not the S&P actually doing it themselves, it's people like her, but, just wait. <laughs> Take a good look at that name that I highlighted at the top left corner. <laughs> that second name ring any bells? Seem familiar? Yes, that's right. It's the very same woman, Melina. The quote in question, of course, says that white tears are the specific phenomenon where a white person starts crying in response to an accusation of racism that they have committed. While the committer might feel sad, guilty, ashamed, focus should not be with them, but with the person who has experienced the harm. Right? And this is all in the backdrop, of course, about when they're, they're discussing racism and all the perils and what not in a classroom setting perhaps who knows but the fact of the matter is this fucking fruitcake is making up terms such as white tears there's a specific term for things that come out of our tear ducts you know wow and fragility is, is mentioned just below that as well it's uh it's nice to know that these are the sort of people that our government have chosen to work with mm, lovely stuff and just to ensure that there's no confusion about the second name, rest assured, it's the very same fucking person. Malina, whatever that name is, I'm not going to pronounce it. And there's her there. So, anyway. So the uh, blonde woman, I early life set it, check, I don't know, be honest. Um, but here's her here. Teacher of amazingly gifted young people. PT inclusion, diversity, anti-racist culture. Loves maths, loves chess, loves diversity, DHS inclusion. I think the DHS inclusion is Drum Chapel inclusion, which is the their club, their anti-racist club, you know. But um, you know, it's just all this talk of diversity and whatnot. It's very bizarre. That in and of itself is bizarre, you know. But you can kind of expect that of many uh, of the modern day quote quote women or men as well, just fucking weirdos that have embraced this ideology, who line and sinker, that's part and parcel with the modern day society, but when they start to infest their shit in and around the environment of children, that alone is grounds for concern as far as I'm concerned, but the fact that there's something that this woman reveals in her blog that was not just shared by herself, but by Malina at some point as well, Education Scotland's website is where the blog is held, uh, I, I don't know, like... Uh, there's just something not quite right about this, I have to be honest, and I want to go on record and say that I am not entirely convinced that this woman is all there, as opposed to just being a fruitcake who's embraced uh, this through Klein and Sinker, like the other one, who I actually believe is more of an opportunist as opposed to uh, a fruitcake, but a fruitcake nonetheless. Um, I genuinely, I, I don't know, I, I can't 
quite put my finger on it. So I'm not going to sit and berate her too much on the grounds off that, but that doesn't negate from what I'm about to fucking show you. And it could be a nothing burger in many respects, but I still think people should fucking see it for what it is, considering it's so blatantly in your face that she says it. So on her actual blog, I don't go on the now, like, um, right here. Right fucking here. Wait, I'll zoom in about to get this out of the... So the author of the blog is Angel Hinkley, right? She's a principal teacher of inclusion, diversity and culture, a maths teacher and working mainly with young people with autism. Now, it's my understanding from what I've read here and there that the uh, the, the sort of curriculum, not, uh, well, I the curriculum, the one that embedded everywhere, on top of that, uh, and I'm not going out of my way to deliberately insinuate here, I'm just more or less paraphrasing what I've been hearing. Uh, it's not exactly groundbreaking information here, but it goes without saying that um, <coughs> the Building Racial Literacy Programme, that's the same sort of concept, they want to embed it everywhere, it has to be discussed everywhere. So, is there a possibility that this woman working with kids with autism, she's promoting this nonsense to them? Because she seems to be promoting it everywhere else. So what's stopping her promoting it to kids with autism? Just because it's in a mathematical uh, setting, that doesn't stop her. That would that doesn't need to stop her. Or does she know to stop then because they've got autism? I think that's a question that really needs to be asked fundamentally because I don't entirely think this is quite right. Eh? I'm sorry, it's, it, it has not sat right with me. I, when I first found it, as I said, with the stuff on my telegram, but I wanted to see a, a bit more before I started jumping to any sort of like overall conclusions about things because I don't know this woman, right? But then obviously the other tweet that I responded to last night because I just I don't think she's all there and if she's not all there then there's a good possibility that she is fucking saying this stuff to kids with autism. You know, so obviously her blog here, decolonizing the curriculum and as her tweet says, I'm really passionate about this. I mean, it's a bit bizarre, is it not? You know, why can't you just teach your kids? But nah, you've embraced this shit and you know, it's all about being really passionate. You love diversity according to your Twitter blog. Yeah, but get the fucking picture, eh? So, it says, expo exploring positive narratives that challenge assumptions, empower learners, and inspire unity. Ah, oh, whatever. You know, um, so, she goes on to say, I'll read a wee bit of this, but, I mean, my name is Angel Hinkley, and I don't necessarily know if that's really your name, but, however, I am a teacher at Drum Chapel High School, where I have the privilege of leading the efforts to decolonize the curriculum as principal teacher of inclusion. What sort of fucking school adopts somebody to have that job title? Is ah, That's anybody's guess. But how did you obtain that position? What's your background, exactly? Or is it just simply because you love diversity? There's got to be more met. There's got to be some reason that they hired you as opposed to some other anti racist expert. And if you are an expert, where did you gain your expertise? Be interesting to find out so we can obtain information regarding whether or not you are indeed a bit of a fruitcake. And you know? Um, being given the opportunity has opened an incredible door, but it's also raised awareness and questions about why this has been lacking in our curriculum. Oh, are you going to tell us why? Or are you just going to leave that for us to uh, jump to assumptions for ourselves? My recent attendance at Education Scotland's Building Racial Literacy Programme has provided me with an incredibly strong foundation and they continue to provide ongoing support in my current role. Programme was inspired, has inspired, sorry, and has empowered me, giving me confidence and awareness that this is only the beginning of a journey filled with complexities. Mistakes will be made in bravery, humility and compassion will be essential. Well, they fucking... Uh, fruitcake is starting to go off the Richter scale here because half of that just is absolute waffle for the sake of waffle. But again, it's not on top of that though, this is the sort of thing that I've heard before. So they, to a degree, are just repeating each other. Anyway, um, sorry. So it says here, fucking hate having to lurch over my bed. I'm six foot three and I'm having to bend over as if I've got, a, you know, a frail back just to try and ensure that my volume's a bit louder so people stop treating me like I'm drooling colouring in my colouring book incorrectly like a retard. I know that I'm having issues with my volume and whatnot. It's the technology as opposed, as opposed to my uh, retardation. Thanks for the concerns anyway. Um, <laughs> mistakes we made. I, the program has had a tremendously positive impact. 
not only professionally, but also personally. I have dyslexia. Wait, wait a minute, I need to go down a bit, sorry. Uh, I have dyslexia, and it has been a heavy weight that I have carried my entire life. Fighting to be seen for myself rather than the prejudices that come with it. I mean, for fuck's sake. I mean, I'm pretty sure that the dyslexia she's referring to is the numerical one. I've got that. I've never been diagnosed, but I've got a lot of the same sort of symptoms. I don't know what the fuck she's talking about in relation to there being any prejudices that come with it. Nobody cares at all. So, potentially, I don't know. Not jumping the gun, but you're not exactly selling yourself here, are you? And again, I couldn't care less about whether or not you've struggled with your dyslexia. This is irrelevant shit to me. All I'm really concerned about is, well, first and foremost, you're promoting or you're, in, you're involved in a program that's centred around critical race theory training, which in turn then relies on you creating an anti racist club to promote the same shit you've been taught, and you work with autistic kids as well on top of that. That, to me, I don't know about that, like, I don't know, doesn't sit right, I've got to be quite fucking frank. Uh, anyway, this program removed the barrier, and I was seen for who I am and what I can do. So, like, an anti-racist program has removed the barriers that you claim existed because you've got dyslexia. I mean... <laughs> I don't know what sort of life she's lived, maybe. Maybe she lives in a bigoted part of Scotland where they really don't like those pesky dyslexics, but from where I'm from, nobody cares, so I'm really finding this difficult to get my head around, to be honest. Fucking see this bed and all, like, that. Oh, there you go. Am I falling off the side it, trying to lurch over a shit mic? <laughs> ah, it's distracting, man. Um, more than any other time in my life, I have found myself immersed in learning and no longer expending a huge amount of effort trying to conceal my dyslexia and living for fear of being discovered. Oh, oh my god, like, come on the fuck, like, <laughs> I mean, you're on the verge of making me want to start poking in front of you here, eh? Not the intention of the video. I'm trying to be somewhat on the ball with this one, but come on. So she's writing this blog to share with you one aspect of the story of curriculum decolonization, namely the positive narrative and the positive impact it brings. She'd like to bring you to come along with her on the journey through time around the globe through the eyes of a young person having the feeling of belonging and empowerment. The story starts with the Haitian Revolution. Oh, for fuck's sake. For over 200 years, the slavery, a slave trade was responsible for the torturing, maiming and dehumanizing. I mean, this is the same sort of thing as Uncle Ben was doing as well. They never take into, they never put it into the context that it deserves. I don't give a fuck about your positive spin at the end of this. The point is though, you started it off, you started your wee story off to the kids about the evil slavery from the white man, never really elaborating on the context of the time, who else was involved, what other forms of slavery were taking place, you know, like the removal of your penis, if you were uh, enslaved by Muslims, or the uh, Barbary slave trade, etc. Now nah, at least we treated them with a bit of common courtesy, and they get to keep their fucking booby. But that will be talked about, I assume not. That'd be too crass to talk to children about, but it's absolutely fine to talk to them about critical race theory, so I'm not entirely sure what is and what is not actually allowed to be on the table or all for this fucking point. Anyway, I'll stop poking fun at this shit and I will just read a bit, right, so you get the point of what she's talking about here with her positive messages. She says, um, down here about, the narrative must be told, obviously, um, but this is only, uh, but, but if this is the only story presented to black pupils, and for that matter the rest of the class, they will only see African people being dehumanised. Empowering all young people is an important part of our job as educators. Educators, sorry. The revolution is not a story without its horrors. It was a brutal revolution when France demanded the crippling estimated 21 billion and to raise money to compensate former slave owners. Uh, at the same time, the Haitians were being de demonised and struggling to develop as consequences of a suffering US embargo. However, this revolution Revolutionary story is an important and inspiring part of history, as the Africans in Haiti uh, defeated the three major European empires, the French, British and Spanish. Uh, they declared their independence were the first nation to abolish slavery. Many of my evenings have been spent reading about this revolution, the determination, pre preservance, bravery, intellect, <laughs> and the stories of many leaders such as Cecil Fatiman 
and Sanity Belair, which struck me was strategic planning that led to the departure of these empires from Haiti. It is a powerful message to all, but now she's wanting to take you to America, right? Okay, where her journey, her learning journey, I should say, introduced her to Maggie Lena Walker. I will begin her story with a quote. Let us awake, let us arise, we can do anything as, see, as soon as we learn the lessons of unity. She was the founder of the first female African-American president of St. Luke, Luke's penny-saving bank that survived until 2005, believing that people should entrust their money with people that have shared their struggle and not with people that do not value you. Let us put our monies together and have a bank that will take the nickels and turn them into dollars. The fact that Maggie started a bank in the early 20th century is mind-blowing because married women in America were unable to have a bank account at all until the 70s. The elevation of women to her proper and rightful place has been the slowest work of the centuries. Let the women become independent. She has also accomplished many other remarkable feats such as founding a newspaper and serving as managing director where Bane voices could be heard. Her story is one of empowerment and it inspires encourages teacher unity oh well i mean you've gone from teaching about oh they overcame the evil terrorist empire eh, imperialist empires you know some sort of star wars narrative now you've gone back on your word really have you not and you've started talking about bames prioritizing bames for the sake of being fucking bame Anyhow, now you're going to talk about Britain, but, you know, time's off the essence, shall we say. So I don't know if I'll read too much more. I'll scroll through it and resume if I need to. Well, she brings up everybody's favourite Cheddar Man. Of course she does. Why would she not? Uh, with this in mind, I would like to introduce you to Cheddar Man, discovered in the British village of Cheddar. He is the oldest virtually complete skeleton, nearly 10,000 years old. And experts have revealed that Cheddar Man shares 10% of his DNA with people living in the UK today. There is a 76% chance that Cheddar Man was dark to black. Prior to the DNA test, it was assumed that he was white. For me, digging into the facts of the story highlights the importance of teaching young people to question assumptions made and why they're being made. Oh, is that right? Well, I mean, there's a lot of holes in this Cheddar Man story, eh, from what I recall. But even if he was fucking black, who the hell, or dark skin, shall we say, who the hell cares? Where's the umpteen Cheddar Man skeletons being fucking picked up around the country? It's not happened, has it? It's an anomaly, more or less. Right, <laughs> for the most part, um, doesn't really prove anything. And even, I, so, but again, so what? Digging into the facts of the story. What fucking facts? There's not that many facts to obtain, you know. <laughs> and then she actually at one point brings up Egypt. You know, what about the Egyptian mummies that they've got? Uh, they've got ties, or they're more closely related to uh, the Europeans of today. She doesn't mention that though. And of course, fuck that. Isn't, ah. No, no way. But she does, but it mentions the uh, Egypt at the bottom, if I remember rightly. But, you know, more on the Cheddar Man thing. Laura Towler and that did do stuff on that years ago. Uh, I can't really remember, to be honest, but it's not as clear cut as they make that out to be, if I'm mistaken. If I'm not mistaken. And there was something doing the rounds on Telegram not long ago about a picked DNA pick of a picked. And, uh, you know, thought to be white as well, so get it fucking up, you. And uh, uh, aye, because they did a sort of um, reconstruction of what he would have looked like today based on what they'd found. So it was something uh, along those lines. White, not black or brown or dark skin. So, uh, so, so what now? All those questions and assumptions that were, you know, being debated. Can we put them to rest? No, probably not. There are so many positive stories out there. Many will, uh, of you will have your own stories. Each narrative must be encouraged in order to develop a deeper understanding of world history as a series of interconnected events. The narrative of such events should be meaningfully connected to the learning. This will help to ensure that decolonizing the curriculum does not fall into the trap of adding tokenistic stories. Our young people are attempting to figure out who they are and where they fit into the world. As educators, we've got a responsibility to equip them with the tools that they require to see themselves and not feel like an imposter or uh, attempting to fit into a world which they do not belong. You know, you can dress it up like that if you wish, but the problem here that we have is you're taking the fact that minorities know the f notice that they're minorities, feel the way that they feel because they're noticeable not minorities, and you want to change that. But in order to change that, you start perpetuating a false fucking narrative that they've always been here. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm putting it in the most layman terms possible. That's more or less what's going on here, you know. Um... Alright, so there's mass pish here. Oh, there's a bit Egypt, though, yeah. Uh, I started out and remain a last teacher, so sub subject loyally pulling me to conclude with two more stories. Well, get yeah, this is the last one I'm fucking reading. Uh, 
<clears throat> one about the right angle triangle and the other about the abacus. Frequently asked in questions and mass, what is the point of this? When would I ever use this? Uh, we are now going to Egypt to around 2500 BCE when the Egypt pyramids of Giza were built. Pythagoras theorem which enables you to make a right angle triangle was one of the uh, one of the techniques employed. Mass has been used to help create one of the seven wonders of the world that has stood for over 4,000 years. The concept of mass becomes much more relevant and useful when I teach Pythagoras. I use a map of the globe to show in the world this historic event occurred. Then we move northeast to Iraq, Iran and Syria, where I explain there is archaeological evidence of the Babylonians learning Pythagoras theorem. What's your fucking point? What is your point? Because the people that lived there back then were not the people that live there now. Africa, uh, but Egypt is just a fucking shithole now. The ancient Egyptians were nothing like the Egyptians of today, despite the we was Kang's narrative. So what's the fucking point? It's not a shock and all. It really just depends on how you're presenting this and what you teach to these kids. But fundamentally, we know what you're doing because you're just as malevolent as the rest of them. But anyway, to conclude, because I just I wanted to kind of read through some of this so she expressed herself, because she does come across as a bit of a fruitcake. But the point remains the same, fruitcake or not, why is she allowed to promote critical race theory in schools while also being in contact with kids with autism? I think that's a bit strange, if you ask me. But I'm not here to pass judgement because I don't know the ins and outs of the, you know, the intrinsic details on the matter. I just think up front it's a bit strange, you know, right? And anyway, so the reason I inevitably said something to her on Twitter yesterday is because, you know, she still waffles like a weirdo. Um, so this tweet here says that uh, Wales is the first UK nation to have compulsory education about racism and the contributions of figures from BAMES, right? It's a hashtag anti-racist, okay? Well, Scotland's, well, past that fucking point now. If that doesn't stop the fruitcake question and taking to her little Twitter podium to ask the following. Scotland next. We are all globally connected. See, this is globally connected shit, again. That is absolute waffle. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, globally connected and have been for thousands of years. It's shite. No, we fucking haven't. Absolute babble. But nonetheless, this needs to be seen. Anti-racist, all belong, decolonising the curriculum. I mean, I thought the whole purpose of decolonising the curriculum was, in theory, to sort of eradicate the, the narratives that were created because of colonialism. Now we're just going to start talking about, you know, for thousands of years, we're all being connected. Fuck off, man. I'm sorry. Bollocks. So I inevitably said something. No response as of yet. She'll probably block me when the time comes. Don't really give a shit. Um, point being, <laughs> even if there is nothing at all, uh, per se, wrong with uh, her working with autistic kids while simultaneously being part of this program, or I think she will have finished it now, uh, actually, if it's only for three months or so. Uh, but the point is, <laughs> you've still had uh, a bit of information there that you might not necessarily have seen before. I've done, I've done everything I can really in that respect. Uh, and I've got a fucking... <laughs> got fuck what else to talk about, I think. Uh, so, for now, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have to leave you on that note, I think. But, um, oh yeah, there's, there was some stuff that she shared her on her Twitter. I started saving stuff in case she blocked me. Somebody said to me a while ago that I was lying when I said that they say that uh, colorblind societies are harmful. Um, this, of course, is a much more friendlier version of the anti-racist... Uh, What's it called? I racist educators um websites version of events, shall we say? But it still gives you the same idea. I don't see colour. The dangers of that mentality. This was shared by the guru that I, we've just been talking about for the last wee while. It allows you to ignore the complexities of racial issues that uh, you know would just not be talked about. They don't exist if you don't talk about them. That's how a colorblind society would work. For example, where I lived and grew up uh, as a young Scot, where it was the most, and still is pretty much the most homogenous part of Scotland, the Highlands, that really pisses off. That really fucking pisses off Melina, by the way. Oh, oh, there's something else I could talk about. I might do that separate video, actually, though, time-wise. Time but, um... If somebody came into my classroom and started, you know, making me acknowledge the fact that I look different to the babe that's about to walk in the door, then you'd notice, but I don't know how I would feel if he hadn't brought it up to begin with. But then they start going a step further than that. The, none of the kids in these classes would know about any fucking complex racial issues that you claim exist had you not brought it up in the first place. So, they are the problem. They always have been the problem. But they, they simultaneously want white kids to feel like they are the problem and that society privileges them and the reason that they haven't seen the problem up until date is because of their privilege, etc. So we all need to work together to pull the system down. 
and you know share the power you can't fix something you can't see well oh, fuck off just yeah, right, right, right. that's funny you are not actively dismantling your own prejudice and then they put brackets up they all have them oh yeah they do but there's only one out of the two of us that can be racist though because of your redefined fucking words you know so there's that as well um and then mentality as well that's lovely it limits your ability to appreciate individualism what not seeing colour limits your ability to appreciate individualism how does that make any sense whatsoever because by and large, one of the main issues surrounding whites at present is the fact that they are too individualistic. Therefore, they don't they they, uh, they don't see colour, and that's helped make them so individualistic. They don't even see white. They don't even see each other as white comrades anymore. And, and you know, fucking hell, no racial consciousness. It minimises the struggles of POCs in today's society. You know, that's a perfect way to actually conclude this video because that is, by and large, when all this shit is said and done, that's what it's about. They want to rekindle the flames of race, make kids see race everywhere they look, and racism's everywhere they look, because they can then start to tell them about slavery, the, you know, the very revisionist version of events. They will then say, all the horrors that happened back then, yeah, well look at all the things that are happening now. You know, there's not a BAME police officers, BAME politicians. That's because of the same attitudes that existed back in those times of slavery. So give me that equity, for we are the descendants of the fucking Kangs. Peace.